A reading from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Good morning. Stories. Stories are a fundamental feature of being human, right? We entertain ourselves through stories. We exercise our creativity through stories. Uh, we make sense of the world and our lives through stories. So our brains have evolved these storytelling capacities where we, we tell something with a, a beginning and a middle and uh, an end. And so this is not just uh, an interesting but irrelevant feature of us. This is actually a fundamental feature of being human, telling stories. So to the best of our knowledge, uh, this is not a feature shared by any other creatures on Earth. The best of our knowledge, we're, we're the only species that tells stories, makes sense of, of things through stories. Why am I talking about the centrality of stories to life? Well, because being part of the Christian community includes being part of a community that tells a story. And being a follower of Christ includes understanding the larger story in which the story of Jesus makes sense. And then the story in which our lives make sense in relation to Christ's life in the large story. So today I'm entering into a sermon series about that larger story. And I'm calling this series, The Biblical Story, A Drama in Six Acts. Uh, so my purpose here is to kind of give an overall large scale picture of the biblical story. See things kind of from the 30,000 foot level, if, if you will. This is not new with me. We tend to think of the biblical story in two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. But many um, scholars find it helpful to see the whole the biblical drama story as a drama in six acts. And so that's what I'm going to be looking at over the next few sermons. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is a story in six acts. And today we're going to begin with Act 1, Creation. So we heard a few minutes ago the first several verses of Genesis chapter 1. So this morning I'm going to comment on the biblical creation story. At least uh, the first part found in Genesis chapter 1, verses, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 3. Now unfortunately in the Middle Ages when chapter divisions were being assigned to the Bible, somebody back in the day kind of started chapter 2 in the wrong place. 
Chapter two, real, uh, chapter one really should end at verse three of chapter two, and chapter two should begin at verse four of chapter current chapter two. Regardless, doesn't matter. Here's the opening uh, part of the creation story in Genesis. Verse one. <clears throat> now, verse one, when you open a Bible, doesn't look like a title, a section title. It looks kind of just part of the text. But in the Hebrew, it's actually a section title. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the title of what's now coming. So, then we go through the uh, six days of creation, the seventh day when God rests. And then that all concludes with, so then, this is the story of how, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So I'm going to unpack this for us this morning. But first I want to comment on how the creation story was, uh, gets written in Genesis. So, in the Christian life, we always read scripture in our context. Doesn't matter whether you are in 5th century Syria, 17th century Japan, 19th century Kenya, 21st century Quebec. We always read scripture through the lens of both our culture and our own life experiences. Uh, in other words, we're not reading scripture through the lens of readers of the time. So, without that kind of original historical context, we just simply read the scriptures. And so what we tend to think, kind of as a, kind of as a, a, a default um, way of thinking, is that the words you're reading are, are original words given straight by God, kind of as a deposit into our brains, into the author's, into the author's brains. Sort of like a direct deposit by God as they write. But actually, as they write their words, God is involved in some way that we will uh, talk about in a moment. But their words are deeply connected to context and culture of their day in which they are writing. So it's very helpful to understand the context in which the words of Scripture are written, including the words from Genesis 1, because it really helps us to understand God's way of communicating. And that's kind of going to be a, a part of my focus this morning, God's way of communicating. So, in Genesis 1 to 11, there is much in these chapters that comes from ancient Near Eastern cultures and literature you know, of the day. So, in other words, from the Babylonian and Sumerian cultures around Israel um, back in the days. So, for instance, Genesis 1 to 9 records an outline of world history, from creation to the flood, that is very similar to stories uh, you know, found in pre-biblical Akkadian and Sumerian cultures. What the author of Genesis is doing is using stories from the surrounding culture of the day and modifying them, parts of them, in light of who God is and God's, God's will and truth for humanity. So in other words, they're interpreting the stories of their culture through what we might call a Yahweh lens. So we're going to see in a moment how that, uh, how that works in Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> There's a well-known Old Testament scholar, Gordon Wenham. He says this of Genesis 1 to 11, chapters 1 to 11. Genesis 1 to 11 is a commentary, often highly critical, on ideas current in the ancient world. Both individual stories in Genesis 1 to 11, as well as the final completed work, are a polemic or a rhetorical argument against many of the received notions of the gods and humanity in the ancient Near Eastern uh, traditions and, and cultures. So Genesis 1 to 11 can be understood as a critical commentary on ancient Near Eastern worldviews of the day. So what's happening in the Genesis creation story is that God is using existing cultural material of the day and reshaping it through the author's four truths God was interested in conveying to the people of the time. Let me use an analogy here. Or if many of us are familiar with you know, the analogy of the clay and the potter. I'm going to, uh, that's usually from a different context in the New Testament, but I'm going to use that same analogy here. Just as a potter takes existing clay to reshape it into pottery, 
God takes existing cultural material and uses biblical authors as the potters to reshape that cultural material into the message God wants to convey. Okay? Is that clear as mud? We're going to get to that. We'll see, see it in practice in a moment. So what is the message in Genesis 1? Let's, take, let's now take a deeper dive into Genesis 1 to see. So, in Genesis 1, the big picture is that God wants to bring about life, and especially human life. So, let's go right back to the beginning. All existence at the beginning of Genesis is watery chaos. Well, it's watery chaos. In verse 2, this watery chaos already exists. It's already being created by God. At this point, um, uh, to bring about life and humanity in Genesis 1, God first creates this watery existence. But then, God needs some, some space in there to bring about life and humanity. And somewhere solid for life and humanity in that watery chaos to exist. So there needs to be some land in there. So how will God bring about land and life within the watery chaos? So verse 2 begins to tell us. Now, this watery chaos was formless. In the Hebrew word there is tohu. And empty. In the Hebrew word there is bohu. We're going to come back to those. Was formless and empty. So all existence is just this watery chaos. And it's formless and empty. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. It's very dramatic imagery. The tohu bohu distinction reflects a belief that everything, everything physical has an underlying form to which content is then added. In other words, God will first need to create forms and then... Those forms will remain empty until God adds something to them, till God fills those forms. So, to create a place for land and life, God needs first to create space within that watery chaos. Then in that space, create forms and content for land and life. Now, that may be clear as mud, but we'll it'll clarify in a minute. Because this is an ancient Near Eastern way of thinking. You know, that's kind of why it doesn't make sense to us at first, um, or at second, or at third. Because we're not used to thinking in ancient Near Eastern terms. And that's the context in which God is communicating when Genesis is written. So, to create a place uh, for land and life, God needs to create space within that water chaos and then create forms and content. So, how does God do it? God does that by the six days of creation. God's first step is to solve the tohu problem, the formlessness problem, by creating forms, and then solve the bohu emptiness problem by filling those forms. So how does that work? Well, we come to day one. God creates the first forms. Light, day and night. And so basically what we've got at this point is all that watery chaos, which before day one is all darkness, it says in verse, uh, verse one. It's all darkness. But then day one, God creates light. And so that watery chaos is now light. There's light in there. You can kind of see that watery chaos now, if you, if you were. And that watery chaos goes through the day-night cycle. And so we've got, first of all, we've got light. We've got day and night. Then we've got day two. Here, God starts creating that space for land and life. God separates the waters to create space. Separation, God separates the waters in order to create some space there. And you'll see in that verse, it says that space God calls sky. Now, you've got all this water up here, and you've got this water down here, and you've got sky in between at this point. How does God keep the water in place up here from falling down? God creates firmament. So you'll see in the verses there, in chapter 1, God creates the firmament, or the vault in some translations. That's a firm, um, solid dome over the earth that holds all the waters up. 
so we don't, the whole planet doesn't get flooded. That's where rain comes from. They didn't know about uh, evaporation. Rain comes from all these waters above the firmament. You read ancient rabbinical material, uh, discussions, they talk about, they ask, well, how thick was the firmament to hold up that water? And so some rabbis, uh, ancient rabbis write, well, it was three fingers thick. A firmament had to be three fingers thick to hold it up. Other rabbis write it was hundreds of miles thick, or whatever the equivalent of miles was back in the day. So they had these interesting discussions back then. How thick did that uh, firmament have to be to hold up the rains? Anyways, so that firmament separates the waters uh, above the vault, above the firmament, from the waters underneath the sea. So, okay, we're getting somewhere now. We've got the space created, sky created for the... Uh, for the uh, land to appear. And so here we have day three. Now we have separation of land from the waters and plants emerge on the land. So now we've got land there, plants. We've got, we've, from these first three days, we've got the forms to fill now. So let's see how God does that. Step two, solve the emptiness problem by filling those empty forms in the first three days. Day four, God creates the sun and the moon. Now, many of us have probably wondered, when we've read Genesis 1, hang on, how come the sun and the moon come into existence after day and night? Because that doesn't make sense. We get, our, we get the day-night cycle from the sun. And, of course, you know, night light from reflection on the moon. This is where it comes from. This ancient Near Eastern way of seeing the sun and the moon as filling the emptiness of day and night and of light. What about day five? Well, remember day two, we've got this, the, the sky now, and we've got the water, waters underneath. Well, now we've got to fill the sky and the waters. And so... Day five, we get swimming animals to fill the waters under the sky and flying animals to fill the sky. And so now we've got the water and the sky is filled. And now all we're missing is the animals and the people on the land. Now, so let's fill day three. Let's fill the, the, the land. And there's day six. God creates the animals and the humans. And so there we have the first six days of creation and then we have day seven, God rested. And there's lots of uh, discussion in the old rabbinical material about, you know, texts about, uh, well, did God have, really have to rest? Does God get tired? And all those kinds of, kinds of discussions. <clears throat> uh, and so let me just pop back to day six for a moment. So uh, verse 26 Adama is created. And that's normally translated as Adam in uh, most Bibles. So Adam there in verse 26 is, is gender neutral. There's, there's no humanity. Uh, there, there's humanity at that point. But it's gender neutral. There's, uh, there's a, an Old Testament scholar named uh, William Brown. And he says the best translation actually for Adama in verse Verse 26 is earthlings. Because the, the Hebrew there actually just means earth. Adam, Adam comes from Adam, a Hebrew word for earth. And so the best translation for the first time that word appears, first time Adam appears in verse 26, is earthlings. So then in verse 27, we see two genders, male and female. Day seven, God rested. Now, what are we to do with Genesis chapter one? Because the six days cause, causes much angst in our time. There's you know, long debates on, are those six days literal? Are they figurative? Uh, I mean, I, th I think the text indicates they're, they're figurative even back at the time, but actually, that whole question of is it literal or is it figurative, uh, I would suggest is actually a red herring for us. 
Science is God's gift of knowledge to us, using the brains God gave us to, to you know, um, learn about the world around us. That was true back then, that's true today, and every time in between. And so, the, the, you know, the brains that God has given us has brought us to a point in our society today where we know certain things about physics and chemistry and so forth that describe a universe very different from what we read in Genesis 1. And so what do we do with Genesis 1? So I do not believe that God's intentions in Genesis 1 is to give the definitive account for God's creation for all humanity to believe at all times in history. Instead, I believe Genesis 1, God is giving us a model for how to make sense of God's work in creation through the cultures and contexts of our own time. Through the cultural ideas of one's time. Again, whether you know one, someone lives in 5th century Syria or you know, 18th century uh, Nepal or, or 21st century Quebec. That is through all ages and times and contexts and places. God is calling his people to be potters of the culture to figure out how to use the concepts of the culture of the day to communicate God's eternal truths to a, con- to a context, to a people of that time. So, just as a potter takes existing clay to reshape it into pottery, God takes existing cultural material and uses us as the potters to reshape that cultural material to convey the eternal truths about God for us in our time and place. And so a tohu, bohu, structure conveyed God's eternal truths to the Israelite and Jewish people as they were shaped by ancient Near Eastern cultures. In our age... We need to use the story of physics and chemistry to convey God's eternal truths to people in our own age. And so what are those eternal truths? Well, we're going to look at five of them here, assuming uh, this part updated. (laughs) So, close enough. (laughs) First truth is, there is one God. Now, it depends where you put your emphasis there, who you're talking to. If you're talking to a polytheistic culture, such as back in the ancient Near Eastern days, so that means a culture in which there are many gods and goddesses, then the emphasis there, in first, the first point, is there is one god, not many. If you're in a context that's not polytheistic, but actually atheistic, which is predominantly our culture, uh, or partly our culture today, let's say. The emphasis is on the is. There is one God. So the emphasis there, whether on the is or the one, uh, kind of depends on context. But the, f- the underlying principle there is there is one God. The universe is created by God with purpose. And so this is a second eternal truth for all contexts, I'd argue. The the universe is created by God. It is God's creation. And God created it with purpose. And so in our society today, the message of of much of mainstream science is there's no purpose in the universe. It's just there. We happen to be in this universe. and There, so be it. Just deal with it. Whereas as Christians in our story, we say, no, the universe was created by God with purpose. Then the third element in Genesis chapter 1 is that this creation is fundamentally good. And again, this is in contrast to other worldviews. Both in the ancient Near Eastern world, in which many of the cultures viewed creation simply as this, um, as something negative, created by the gods for their fun, to play with us, to, for humans to just be the play toys of the gods. So, Creation is fundamentally good is in contrast to that kind of view. It's also in contrast to other views through history that have said creation is actually quite negative. Gnostics, um, uh, Jains, and, and, and others who have said creation is fundamentally bad. Or creation is fundamentally indifferent. 
our story says that creation is fundamentally good. After the first five days of creation, God said, after each of those days, this is good. And what did God say after the sixth day? This is really good. Creation is fundamentally good in God's gift. Four, humanity, male and female together, bear God's image. So, back in the day, this, the, the phrase, the image, behind image of God, it's actually taken from ancient Near Eastern culture. It's the word used for the rulers or the kings in their job to be responsible to the gods for overseeing all the people. So, it's the rulers, the pharaohs, the kings, who are the image of the gods. And their job is just to kind of supervise everything else in uh, the chaos of life uh, for, for the gods. What's happening here in Genesis chapter 1 is, first of all, all people are in the image of God. And right away, right there in the first chapter of Genesis, we've got this equal valuation in the Christian story and the Jewish story too at this point, that all people are equal before God because all people bear the image of God. And the other, uh, uh, and so that means consequently that all people are to be God's agents, stewards, caretakers of the earth. So it's not just the ruler who's got responsible for, you know, for the state of the earth. It's actually each and every one of us. And then also it says there that bearing God's image is not just simply an, an individual thing. Okay? I bear God's image, you bear God's image. We do, but it's actually a collective thing. Male and female together bear the image of God. And that just reinforces the point of the equality of all people before God. Male and female together bear God's image and have that responsibility, that equal responsibility. So there's some really important stuff that's so easy for us to miss uh, in that image language. And then find my fifth point this morning, the five lessons from Genesis 1. If God rested, then so must we. Hmm? However you solve the theological question of God, did, did God really need to rest? The point is universally taken um, by scholars everywhere that the point here is, if God rested, we have to take rest too. So, those are, I would suggest, the eternal truths that God is trying to convey through the Genesis 1 story, and that those of us who don't live in the ancient Near Eastern world, whatever period of time and culture we may be, need to continue to convey these truths, these lessons, through the, through the categories, through the, the cultures and concepts of our own times and places. And so there we have... Act one of the biblical story. God created and then God rested. So next Sunday we will come to act two of the biblical story. Please join me in this prayer after I pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for your incredible creation. We thank you that we are part of the story of your creation. Teach us to see your glory through your creation. May we care well for your property, this earth. And teach us to take time to rest. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I invite you please to stand and we will join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, his only son.